May I extend my welcome uh, on behalf of uh, the Wallace Stegner Center for Land Resources and the Environment uh, and for the University of Utah S.J. Quinney College of Law to this annual Wallace Stegner Lecture event, uh, which kicks off uh, our uh, annual symposium, uh, this year being the 20th uh, anniversary of that symposium, uh, and this year's topic being air quality, uh, <coughs> health, energy, and uh, economics. Uh, and uh, our lecture, as reflected in the title up here, uh, ties directly uh, into that. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Bob Keiter, the director of the uh, Wallace Stegner Center, uh, at, which I've had the pleasure of doing now for uh, all of these uh, 20 years. Uh, and it has been a true pleasure. Let me, uh, let me, uh, uh, just uh, begin by thanking uh, our principal uh, funders uh, and our sponsors uh, for uh, the symposium uh, and for the annual uh, Stegner Lecture. Principal funding uh, for uh, the symposium uh, comes to us from the R. Harold Burton Foundation, uh, which was uh, our founding donor uh, and has been our principal donor uh, for the last uh, 20 years, since 1996. Uh, we also have received uh, funding uh, continuously uh, for a number of years now from the Cultural Vision Fund, uh, which supports not only uh, the Stegner Center Symposium, but also our Young Scholar Program and our lecture series. Uh, sponsors for this year's uh, annual symposium include also uh, the S.J. and Jesse E. Quinney Foundation, which I should note uh, provided uh, initial funding to really uh, establish uh, the Wallace Stegner Center uh, here at uh, the College of Law. The Nature Conservancy in Utah, the American Bar Association Section of Environment, Energy, and Resources, and the Natural Resources uh, Law Forum, uh, all of whom uh, provide important support for these events. Let me encourage you, uh, if you have not uh, already registered, uh, to join us for the annual symposium, which kicks off tomorrow morning uh, at the Rose Wagner uh, Center for Performing Arts uh, downtown on 3rd South. Uh, brochures about the symposium are available on the tables uh, outside. Uh, it's still possible to register either today here or uh, tomorrow morning at uh, the symposium. Uh, let me also uh, note uh, an upcoming event, uh, which is our annual Young Scholar Program. Uh, Professor Emily Hammond from George Washington University School of Law will be joining us. Uh, she'll deliver a downtown continuing legal education program at the Holland and Hart Law Firm on March 11th. Uh, more pertinent, perhaps, uh, to this audience on the 12th, that, that is uh, next uh, Thursday. Uh, she will be here to deliver a lecture on uh, risk and retroactivity in energy and environmental law. Uh, again, there are flyers outside. Uh, uh, describing the program uh, and the Cultural Vision Fund has provided uh, the uh, initial uh, and continuing funding to support uh, this important Stegner Center program. Let me introduce uh, Bob Percival, who's the Robert F. Stanton Professor of Law and the Director of the Environmental Law Program at the University of Maryland uh, Carey School of Law. Uh, Bob has his uh, undergraduate degree from McAllister College uh, with honors, I should note, uh, and his uh, Juris Doctorate and a Master's degree from Stanford University where he was the managing editor on the Stanford Law Review and uh, the Nathan Abbott Scholar, an award acknowledging his placement as number one uh, in his class at uh, uh, Stanford. Uh, prior to joining uh, the Maryland faculty, uh, he served as a law clerk for Judge, Judge Shirley Huffstedler, 
on the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Uh, and uh, he also had the privilege of clerking at the United States Supreme Court for Justice Byron uh, White. Uh, he then served as a special assistant to the first uh, U.S. Secretary of Education and as a senior attorney for the Environmental Defense Fund before entering uh, academia. Since coming into academia, he has, among other things, written uh, and edited uh, the country's uh, uh, most widely used environmental law casebook, Environmental Regulation, Law, Science, and Policy, that's now in its seventh uh, edition. Uh, that's long staying power for casebooks, Bob. Uh, he's got a hundred uh, publications uh, that address environmental law, federalism, presidential powers, regulatory policy, and legal history. He's visited at Harvard Law School and Georgetown University Law Center. Uh, and uh, most recently, uh, he received the senior uh, that is this past year, uh, Senior Distinguished Education Award from the IUCN, International Union of, uh, for the Conservation of Nature, uh, Academy of Environmental Law, uh, in recognition of his outstanding teaching and contributions in the field of environmental law. Uh, with no further ado, uh, please welcome Bob Percival. I'm so fond of Utah from my childhood memories. I grew up in Des Moines, Iowa, and uh, a couple of summers, my parents would pack the five kids, uh, the first time we were all under 10 years of age, in the back of a station wagon, drive out to southern Utah and camp out and just explore the wondrous beauty of southern Utah. And my father had this obsession with wanting to visit every national monument that had Native American ruins. And that was one of the things that really helped inspire me to uh, love nature and want to get involved in environmental law. Uh, these days, I'm doing a lot of work in China. Uh, where environmental conditions, as you may have heard, are very different than in the United States. Uh, air quality at times there is off the charts in a really bad way, to the point where they're trying to invent new terms for it, uh, post-apocalyptic. Uh, it's estimated by the World Health Organization that 1.2 million people die every year in China from exposure to air pollution. About several years ago, they estimated about 700,000. The Chinese government got offended and made, made WHO take that off their website. But now everyone realizes that, and the central government realizes that it's essential to make environmental protection a priority. So this can be openly uh, discussed there. Uh, at times, they've had to shut down the airport because the pollution was so bad. When I last visited China, it was my 33rd trip there uh, in uh, last November, the pollution was so bad that you literally could not see the uh, Beijing airport terminal from the runway. Um, now, just you may have heard just in the last week, a former TV anchor uh, in China, uh, Chai Jing, has filmed her own uh, documentary that she's put on YouTube about her own experience being pregnant for the first time and fearing for the health of her child because of environmental pollution in China. And this has gotten over a million hits within the first day or two. There are, are now uh, 100 million, I'm sorry, 100 million. There are now something like 280 million comments about this on microblogs in China. And the government censors did not take it down the brand new head of China's Ministry of Environmental Protection, uh, Chen Jining, uh, has praised her and said this might become the silent spring uh, for China. Uh, so what I want to talk about today is why are things so bad in China, but we've been so much more successful, we still have problems, in pursuing clean air in the United States and why the U.S. example is now something that's highly prized by the Chinese to the point where President Obama and uh, Xi Jinping, the Chinese leader, agreed in November on an unprecedented new climate agreement where for the very first time the Chinese have agreed to cap their greenhouse gas emissions. 
Uh, and what I want to emphasize as we look back over the history of efforts to protect air quality in the United States is that there have been several critical junctures when we made bold decisions in the face of people saying that what we were trying to do was impossible, the technology didn't exist. We chose clean air. And at many times there have been what you might even describe as political miracles that have helped make this possible. Now, economists and uh, political scientists have told us at times that it shouldn't be possible uh, to have strong environmental protections because it involves an issue where you have concentrated costs on powerful industries in return for diffuse benefits, many of which are not realized for many, many years. And so the lobbies that are going to be most affected by regulation should be able to, in many cases, de defeat, delay, or postpone regulation. That was the thesis of uh, the late um, economist Mansur Olson, who at the University of Maryland, in the logic of collective action. How have we been able to overcome this in the United States? Well, many people think environmental law was born in 1970 in the United States when we got our first major laws like the National Environmental Policy Act and the Clean Air Act, but it actually has a much longer history. Um, back a century ago, the Supreme Court heard within its original jurisdiction disputes between states over interstate pollution. We had generally inherited common law from England where since the 17th century, at common law, you had a right to sue over a nuisance, anything that interfered with the quiet use or enjoyment of land. And in a famous case from the 17th century called Aldred's case, a British court had held that you didn't have to be a trespassory invasion in order for it to be actionable. If someone's pigsty smelled so badly that it destroyed your ability to sit out in your backyard at your country house, you could sue them for a private nuisance. Uh, in similar fashion, although from a different line of cases, the law of public nuisance arose. Uh, what used to be common law crimes, things like poaching in the king's game reserve, interfering with highways, was used by states uh, back in the early 20th century to deal with severe pollution problems. And the first famous case was the Georgia versus Tennessee Copper case, which was filed originally just after the turn of the century, where farmers in Georgia complained because all their crops had died as a result of the incredible pollution that was coming from a smelter that had absolutely no pollution controls because there was no technology to control the pollution from the smelters at the time. So Georgia, on their behalf, filed a public nuisance action in the U.S. Supreme Court, and uh, after years of having uh, evidence gathered in the case, the court, in a famous opinion by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, said states have the sovereign right to protect their citizens against air pollution, and that that meant that the court could use its equitable power, something the Supreme Court rarely used, to actually issue an injunction. And the Supreme Court issued an air pollution control injunction that required the company to cut back on its production in a way that ultimately forced them to develop new pollution control technology, the lead acid chamber method, which became the first technology to control sulfur pollution from smelters. Now, at the time, the copper industry in Tennessee uh, that where the smelters were located was the source of about over half of the economic livelihood of the communities. The Supreme Court didn't want to shut them down, so they didn't order the pollution completely halted. But what they did by requiring these production cutbacks is creating an incentive to look for new technology to control uh, the pollution. Uh, as new technologies were invented, sometimes they weren't always environmentally benign in ways that we did not fully understand. Thomas Midgley was a famous chemist who had two marvelous discoveries for the time, chlorofluorocarbons and tetraethyl lead, 
Both were viewed at the time as major advances. CFCs greatly improved refrigeration technology that enabled food to be preserved and transported over la larger distances. Tetraethyl lead cheaply boosted the octane of gasoline. It was only later that we realized how much destruction they were doing to our environment. Uh, in 1925, a controversy arose over the use of leaded gasoline with Alice Hamilton, the first female professor at the Harvard uh, School of Public Health, arguing that we should not allow lead additives to be put in gasoline because they inevitably would result in lead getting in the air and uh, poisoning uh, people. The Surgeon General recommended that a quick study be done where they compared the health of filling station attendants at stations that sold leaded gas with those that sold unleaded gas, found no difference, and said, well, this is a problem we have to monitor, but we'll let leaded gasoline uh, be used. The result was, over several decades, tremendous increases in lead poisoning, uh, particularly for those who were exposed near thoroughfares. Um, Perhaps the worst pollution episode in the United States uh, at the time occurred in October 1948, where as a result of an inversion, a zinc company in Donora, Pennsylvania's emissions proved so toxic that night, day turned into night, 20 people died, thousands were taken to the hospital, and this helped spur greater environmental consciousness in the United States. There are two excellent uh, books I wanted to recommend. Deborah Davis, who's from the area of Denora, Pennsylvania, uh, has written this book, When Smoke Ran Like Water, that describes it in great detail. And Noga Morag Levine has a history of the use of the common law to respond to uh, air pollution. Uh, in both cases, the law could respond after the fact when you had really big visible nuisances. But when you had something like lead poisoning where the effects, uh, which are generally neurological, uh, aren't so apparent immediately, we had a hard time adopting preventative regulations. Uh, it still blows my mind that when I was a small child uh, back in the 1950s and the early 60s, uh, here in Nevada, uh, here uh, close to Utah, in Nevada, uh, the Nevada test site, some years our, we were engaged in such a nuclear arms race with the Soviet Union that we were exploding more than one nuclear explosion a week in the atmosphere. You could even see the mushroom clouds from the Las Vegas casinos. And one of the real hist uh, heroes of environmental history are the scientists who started warning us that this was leading to an atmospheric buildup of strontium-90 and other radioactive substances, not just in Nevada or Utah, but all around the world. And that helped lead, uh, convince world leaders, President Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev signed the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in uh, the early 1960s, where they at least agreed that testing would be done underground. Um, two other scientists who were heroes are Caltech's geochemist Claire Patterson, who did the studies during the 1960s that showed how much lead from leaded gasoline was getting into the air and the impact that was going to have on health. And Dr. Irving Selikoff of Mount Sinai Medical Center, the epidemiologist who did the first major study showing that hundreds of thousands of workers were dying as a result of exposure to asbestos, particularly during World War II in the shipyards. Uh, we all know our Silent Spring, uh, which came out in the early 60s, uh, was uh, directed at the buildup of synthetic organic chemicals in our environment. This helped produce a mass movement that led to the first Earth Day. We just recently, and this is something that uh, most people aren't aware of, uh, had the 50th anniversary of President Lyndon Johnson being the first to take note of the possibility that the buildup of greenhouse gases was going to cause harm to the planet. He noted that this generation has altered the composition of the atmosphere on a global scale through radioactive materials and a steady increase in carbon dioxide 
from the burning of fossil fuels. Uh, Earth Day, April 22nd, 1970, mass movement, millions take to the streets to demand that Congress enact legislation to deal with environmental problems. Um, I actually did not participate in the Earth Day demonstrations. I was in college. I was protesting the Vietnam War that day, so there were all kinds of uh, things involved. In the uh, run-up to the 1972 presidential election, we had an unusual set of political circumstances where President Nixon thought that the rival candidate would be Senator Edmund Muskie, who was the chair of the Senate Environment Committee that was helping to draft some of this new legislation. So what you saw was actually a competition between the two to see who could be the greenest and propose the most radical environmental legislation. Most people don't realize this, but in his initial environmental message, President Richard Nixon proposed that we set a national goal to phase out the internal combustion engine within 10 years. When, when Al Gore later, decades later, in his book said maybe we should do that over 20 or 30 years, he was denounced as a radical. But at the time, uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, that was not considered so radical. Uh, Richard Lazarus, uh, a Harvard Law professor, in his wonderful book, The Making of Environmental Law, uh, goes into great detail about this history. And he notes that uh, from Nixon's tapes and records, it's quite clear that he didn't have any personal passion for the environment. He just was doing this largely out of political necessity. And he turned around later and uh, denounced the environmentalists in 1972, vetoed the Clean Water Act, but it was enacted by uh, override of his vetoes. But the landmark law in the US to help clean up our air was the Clean Air Act of 1970. It was radical in many respects. Uh, it required uniform national minimum standards for air quality. It directed that makers of automobiles would have to cut pollution from them by 90% within five years or they could sell no more cars. For the first time, it established citizen suit provisions where ordinary citizens could sue not only violators of the environmental laws, but also agencies that failed to carry out the mandatory duties that they had uh, under those laws. This was enacted despite cries of doom from the regulated community. The auto industry claimed that it was going to be totally impossible to come up with the technology to reduce their emissions by 90%. They talked about uh, it shutting down the economy and the auto industry. Uh, there's this wonderful uh, uh, group that runs the Cry Wolf Project, which uh, goes back and looks at uh, some of the claims that were made. There's always this tendency for uh, the regulated community to engage in strategic behavior when you're considering adopting regulations. You say horrible things will happen and exaggerate as much as possible in order to forestall yourself from being regulated. But once the regulations are adopted, American industry has proven to be incredibly creative at being able to come up with ways of developing new technologies. Uh, now, another instance where there was sort of a miracle with respect to the Clean Air Act was the creation of what we now know as the PSD program for prevention of significant deterioration. The Sierra Club focusing solely on the words in the very prefatory goal section of the Clean Air Act, that it's the purpose of Congress was to enhance and maintain air quality, argued that it was absolutely required that EPA establish a program to protect air quality in parts of the nation that already would meet the new National Ambient Air Quality Program uh, standards. Uh, and they won in federal district court. The government appealed to the DC Circuit. The DC Circuit split evenly, which affirmed the decision below. It was then taken up by the US Supreme Court. And um, 
I spent a couple of summers going through all the papers of the justices that became available uh, when uh, the late Justice Thurgood Marshall died and then later when uh, the late Justice Harry Blackman died. And um, those papers revealed the Supreme Court originally had voted five to three that there would be no, that PSD was not required that it wasn't explicitly in the statute, didn't have to be adopted. It was only because Justice Marshall at the last minute shifted his vote uh, that meant that Justice Stewart's opinion saying EPA was not required to worry about areas where air quality was always, already healthy uh, turned into a vote that comes out the opposite way because if the court splits evenly, it keeps in place the decision below which is the district court decision. So Justice Stewart sent around a memo uh, saying, here's my new, much shorter version of my opinion, which is simply affirmed by an equally divided court. And that's how we initially got the PSD program, which is now such an essential part of the Clean Air Act, particularly as we talk about uh, EPA's plans for greenhouse gas regulation. Now, ultimately, this was ratified in the 1977 amendments. Um, in 1974, two scientists working on the environmental impact statement for the space shuttle, F. Sherwood Rowland and Mario Molina, came up with the theory that chlorofluorocarbons were so stable that if released into the air, they could make their way all the way to the upper atmosphere where they would interact with the Earth's protective layer of ozone that protects us from ultraviolet radiation that would otherwise give us skin cancer and destroy it. And that theory struck a chord with the American public which started to realize for the first time we really may be doing damage to our planet. The most ubiquitous use of CFCs at the time was as a, a propellant in spray aerosols. We used to all have the old spray-on deodorants, uh, and the public just stopped buying them so dramatically that it was very easy for EPA to take the lead in, in banning these substances. And in fact, it then became a global movement that ultimately uh, uh, ended up in the 1987 Montreal Protocol, which has probably been the greatest success story for global environmental law. The nations of the world got together, agreed to phase out these harmful chemicals, and had the developing countries that had produced most of them phase them out first and most rapidly, followed later by the developing countries uh, who uh, got funds from a fund set up by a tax on CFCs. Now perhaps, I, I think the most overlooked but most significant court decision ever with respect to the Clean Air Act was the Ethel Corporation decision by the DC Circuit in 1976. Tomorrow on the opening panel, I'm going to be talking about the lead and gasoline uh, story and go into this in more detail. But basically, after a long struggle, EPA for the first time put limits on how much lead could be in gasoline. The lead industry sued and said you can't prove that leaded gasoline has harmed specific individuals. EPA said we don't have to. This is precautionary regulation. And initially, the regulations were struck down by a two-to-one vote of a three-judge panel. The entire DC Circuit then took the case on banc, and by a single vote, a five-to-four majority, the court said EPA doesn't have to have the same kind of proof you would need in an old common law lawsuit against someone that you claimed had harmed you. They're engaging in precautionary regulation. This endorsement of precautionary regulation is probably the, the strongest by any court in the United States, and it led to a very happy ending, as we'll discuss later. Uh, then, in 1981, when I was first uh, starting out as a practicing environmental lawyer for the Environmental Defense Fund, I wanted to move back out west. I decided I was going to spend the rest of my life in California, where I'd gone to school and clerked for the Ninth Circuit. I got hired by the Berkeley Office of the Environmental Defense Fund. And they said, why don't you stay in DC for a couple of years? Because now that President Reagan's taken office, we're going to have a lot of litigation, because he at least campaigned against environmental regulation, famously said uh, trees cause uh, more pollution than automobiles. 
In fact, that led to a wonderful Greenpeace demonstration where they got a bunch of people to dress up in tree costumes, and they were holding signs saying, cut us down before we kill again. <laughs> um, but one of the first things President Reagan did was that he uh, appointed a task force on regulatory relief chaired by Vice President George H.W. Bush. And what this group did was they literally wrote to top business executives and said, which regulations do you want us to get rid of? And one of the ones that was most unpopular with the uh, oil refiners was the limits on lead in gasoline. So they actually proposed, let's get rid of all limits on lead in gasoline. Uh, despite the fact that uh, it was quite clear that as more unleaded gasoline was being used so that it wouldn't poison the catalytic converters, lead levels in children's blood was dropping. The Reagan administration said, well, this is progress. That means we don't need those limits anymore. They were going to actually reverse that progress and say eventually everyone will drive cars with unleaded gasoline. Tomorrow I'll tell the story about uh, some of the unusual coalition that helped defeat this, including conservative columnist George Will, who wrote a very influential uh, uh, column attacking the Reagan administration's proposals. Today he is demonizing environmentalists completely. I don't know why he changed. This is from the Wall Street Journal editorial board. They, uh, when the Reagan administration had to back down on this, they accused the environmentalists of scare tactics, and they actually concluded their editorial by saying the worst thing is that the Reagan administration caved in to the environmentalists, and that's very dangerous. Very popular uh, host of Wall Street Week, Louis Rue Kaiser, said any restrictions on lead and gasoline are economically damaging and will produce no health gains. Um, in 1990, uh, the what happened was really a political miracle. After 13 years of gridlock in Congress over things like whether we should have an acid rain program, President George H.W. Bush took office having campaigned that he wanted to be an environmental president. And Senator Byrd of West Virginia had been replaced as Senate Majority Leader by George Mitchell from Maine from a state that was a victim of acid rain. The result was an amazing uh, bipartisan consensus. The, really, the last time this has happened in Congress on such a major piece of legislation. And I just wanted to play uh, a little of this for you so you can hear his remarks upon signing. America's heritage is precious. We will not turn our backs or look the other way. And that means polluters must pay. And so there is a new breeze blowing, a new current of concern for the environment. And today marks a great victory for the environment, the day when we have strengthened our clean air statutes, already the world's toughest. This legislation is not only in America's interest. Uh, like so many of the environmental issues that we are working on, this bill is in the interest of people all over the world. Consensus America's heritage is precious. We will not turn our... Uh, ...signed into law by a Republican president, despite the fact that several Nobel Prize winning economists sent him a letter pleading with him to veto the legislation, saying it was going to harm the economy, it was uh, unduly costly, and that many of the things that it expected industry to do just couldn't possibly be uh, accomplished. Uh, that didn't end attacks on environmental legislation, though. Uh, at the, uh, during the Clinton administration, when EPA strengthened standards for ozone and particulates, uh, as usual, it was subject to judicial review, and just about every argument in the kitchen sink that you could find was thrown in. And surprisingly, a conservative panel of the DC Circuit adopted a constitutional notion that the Clean Air Act violated the non-delegation doctrine because it wasn't specific enough about precisely where to set the standards, that Congress should specify what standards should be adopted. We all know today, given the prolonged legislative gridlock in Congress, what that would mean if everything had to be left up to Congress. Uh, 
Many people thought that the industry might get a sympathetic ear in the Supreme Court, but they were quite surprised at oral argument when having made the argument that we can't live with a statute that gives EPA so much discretion, Chief Justice Rehnquist said, well, we've lived with it pretty well for 20 years, uh, and the court unanimously rejected the challenge to the Clean Air Act. Now, what has this all produced? The U.S. has been amazingly successful in reducing air pollution, and we've done it while the economy has grown. Emissions of the six criteria air pollutants down 72% since 1970, while the economy's gross domestic product increased 219%. How costly has this been? When the 1990 amendments were adopted, the utility industry said, because it was going to require 10 million tons a year cuts in sulfur dioxide emissions, the utility industry said that this would cost up $1,000 to $1,500 a ton. In fact, it costs less than $100 a ton to remove it. Studies that have been done of the costs and benefits of air pollution control have shown that the Clean Air Act and the 1990 amendments together have produced trillions of dollars in net benefits. Uh, and that they're increasing over time. Where do these benefits come from? From the fact that we've greatly reduced deaths due to exposure to air pollution uh, and reduced uh, other uh, types of diseases that limit people's mobility when they're uh, to air pollution. Uh, so despite the fact that we were willing to make bold decisions in the face of cries of doom, has meant we have air that's clean today, but we still have important problems, and perhaps the number one is climate change. And there, the story is also kind of miraculous, at least from a legal standpoint. The nations of the world in June 1992 got together at the Rio Earth Summit and negotiated the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which set up the process for negotiating global limits on emissions of greenhouse gases. Now, I usually like to ask my audiences uh, this question. You guys are so sophisticated that you'll have no trouble with it. Uh, did the U.S. ratify the U.N. Framework Convention on Climate Change? No. Robin's right. President George H.W. Bush went to Rio. Uh, he did water down some of the language in it and sa said, we don't want any specific goals now. He submitted it to the U.S. Senate for ratification, and it was ratified unanimously in October 1992. Unanimously. Now, that's something we can't get anything ratified in the Senate to gay, whether it's you know, against torturing children or whatever, or the law of the sea. Unanimously ratified within months of being adopted. So we agreed to this process to set in motion global controls on climate change. December 1997, the Kyoto Protocols adopted. It was well understood at the time that the, just like we did with CFCs, the rich developed countries that had caused most of the problem would be the ones who would do the first reductions. So the Kyoto Protocol only required developed countries to control their emissions of greenhouse gases. But it was well understood that as countries like China or India that are rapidly developing increase their emissions, they eventually would have to agree on controls. Article 3.1 of the Framework Convention used this concept of common but differentiated responsibilities to recognize that we were not requiring the developing world to control their emissions for now, but obviously we'd have to do it in the future. Uh, now this is something most people don't remember either. September 2000, during the 2000 presidential election, George H.W. Bush is the Republican nominee. He's running against Al Gore, the great environmentalist. Fearful that that issue might hurt him, in September 2000, candidate Bush announces that if he's elected, he's going to get Congress to adopt new legislation to control emissions of carbon dioxide. Now, mind you, he rejects the Kyoto Protocol. He says, 
using the excuse that it doesn't require developing countries to do so right away, but he's promised to do this. So he then appoints Christy Todd Whitman, his EPA administrator. She immediately goes off to Trieste for a conference of the world's environment ministers where she's telling everyone, don't worry about Bush. He's good on the environment. He's pledged as part of his campaign that we'll regulate emissions of CO2 even if we don't do it through the Kyoto Protocol. She arrives back on March 13th and discovers that Vice President Cheney has secretly engineered Bush repudiating his pledge and in fact without even informing her uh, the US uh, president says we're not going to adopt any new controls on greenhouse gases. Then the Bush administration made a huge strategic error that has redounded to the benefit of efforts to control greenhouse gases. And that is that during the Clinton administration, the EPA General Counsel, John Cannon, who now teaches at the University of Virginia, issued an opinion saying EPA did have the authority to regulate greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act because they were pollutants that could endanger public health or welfare. Uh, as a result, in October 1999, at Clinton, however, the Clinton administration said, we don't have any intention of using that authority right now, but we do have it. October 1999, an obscure public interest group that few people were aware of files this petition saying, EPA, please regulate emissions of greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act's provisions that deal with mobile sources. And as happens with most petitions to agencies, it just lays there, nothing happens. Uh, Bush administration takes over and it wanted to put a stake through the heart of the notion that there was authority under the Clean Air Act to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. So what does it do? It revokes the old general counsel's opinion, replaces it with a new general counsel's opinion that says we don't have the authority. But they made one huge strategic additional error they said that in order to show that we really are not going to do anything about greenhouse gas emissions, we are going to formally respond to that petition from October 1999 and deny it by saying, no, we don't have any authority. And secondly, even if we had the authority, we, have no, we don't think we should use it because it doesn't make sense to regulate our greenhouse gas emissions when China and India aren't regulating theirs. Now the reason that was such a huge strategic mistake is that it opened the courthouse door to the environmentalists. Having formally responded to the petition, they now could get judicial review. They took it to the DC Circuit, which voted two to one to uphold the EPA's failure to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. But surprisingly, the US Supreme Court took the case and a decision that John Cannon has called Brown versus Board of Education for the Environment. The Supreme Court, by a five to four majority, held that EPA does have the authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions under the Clean Air Act. That decision probably never would have come about had the Bush administration not been so eager and apparently so stupid to <laughs> deny that petition. But what it did, even though the Bush administration uh, delayed and didn't respond to the order from the court that it should reconsider its decision not to regulate them. It meant that when Bush left office and the Obama administration took over, EPA was able to make the endangerment finding, which triggers regulation under the Clean Air Act, and which has meant that you don't need any new congressional legislation. When Obama first took office, he made his top priority healthcare legislation. Another priority was getting new uh, legislation from Congress to control greenhouse gases. That passed the House very narrowly, didn't make it through the Senate. Some have said that when you take over as president, you get to do one big thing, and that's essentially what Obama did. He wasn't able to do it through legislation, but since the court, highest court in the land had confirmed that EPA has this authority under the existing Clean Air Act, EPA issued regulations. They were unanimously upheld by the DC Circuit, citing Massachusetts versus EPA. And the Supreme Court in the Utility Air Regulatory Group case uh, 
largely upheld the regulations for about 97% of the sources, uh, the result of this is that only two justices on the Supreme Court, Justices Alito and Thomas, continue to question EPA's ability. They think Massachusetts versus EPA should be reversed. Well, what impact is this having at the international level? In 2009, shortly after Obama took office, the State Department sent me on a lecture tour of China to talk up getting Chinese intellectuals and professors behind the notion of China agreeing to limit its greenhouse gas emissions at the important Copenhagen conference that was being held in December 2009. Uh, they didn't, agree. I got nothing but pushback in China. In fact, at one university, a prominent professor stood up after my talk and said, climate change isn't real. If it's real, it's not caused by humans. If it's real and caused by humans, China's already doing everything it should about it and shouldn't do anything more. Uh, it, China refused to agree to limits on their emissions, but President Obama, on his way to accept the Nobel Peace Prize, got the leaders of developing countries together to agree that instead of having a global treaty, what we would at least do is try to elicit voluntary pledges from countries as to what they were willing to do. And China did go along with it. It set the voluntary goal to reduce the carbon intensity of its economy by 40% by 2020, effectively saying we're going to make our economy 40% more energy efficient to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, but we're not going to agree to a cap because we want to continue to grow so fast and our emissions will continue to rise. Now, a year later, I was invited to a conference in China in June 2010 about how China should legally control its greenhouse gas emissions. Should we use our existing legislation or do we need a new law? There had been a sea change in Chinese opinion. What caused this? I was baffled at first, but I came to conclude there were two things. First, China was so stung by all the criticism from the global community for refusing to agree to limits on its greenhouse gases. But secondly, China agreed, uh, discovered that there were huge economic opportunities in green technology. China already had advanced technology for solar energy, wind power, and electric cars. Uh, that's the BYD electric car, which uh, as a Tesla owner, I think is very inferior to the US technology. This is the Tesla showroom uh, in Beijing uh, last year. Uh, electric cars, uh, Teslas aren't selling very well in China because they don't have their uh, charger network set up, but I have hopes that uh, that will uh, change in the future. The other reason China was so slow to worry about greenhouse gases, the environmental community in China had bigger fish to fry. The more immediate problem of a million plus people a year dying from exposure to conventional air pollutants. And as that became more apparent, and as the Chinese authorities themselves were willing to acknowledge that they were suffering economically because of the high levels of pollution, 3.5% of their gross domestic product, $230 billion a year in 2010, they lost because of pollution. Uh, the U.S. Embassy decided to do something really subversive, and that is they set up a real-time Twitter feed of levels of PM 2.5, the really small, most dangerous particulates. China had only regulated PM 10, the larger uh, particulates, but not PM 2.5. And they were telling the public that uh, levels were not as bad as people thought of PM 2.5. But once the US Embassy set up this live Twitter feed, people could find out what the US Embassy said the levels were. It angered the Chinese authorities, and they first said, stop it. Don't provide that feed on the internet. Now, the US responded, well, look, your great firewall has already blocked Twitter, so your populace is not supposed to be able to have access to Twitter, although most people know a way around the great firewall. Um, it eventually got to the point where the Chinese government had to throw in the towel and said, OK, we'll regulate PM 2.5, and we'll allow these feeds. So today, you can, on your iPhone, get real-time data about what levels of air pollutants are like, and you can also compare what the US Embassy's 
air quality monitors say with what the Chinese authorities say. And in fact, uh, there's been an effort uh, on the microblogs to raise money for more people having portable air monitors. I will test the air quality for the Homeland campaign. People are now very interested in uh, what levels of pollution they're being exposed to. As a result, uh, Premier Li Keqiang announced last year that uh, China was going to de declare war on pollution. And they're doing some very uh, innovative things. They have seven pilot programs to uh, cap and trade uh, carbon emissions in seven cities. They hope to turn this into a nationwide program. They're so interested in help in making their law, environmental laws more enforceable that the National People's Congress Standing Committee last year uh, invited a group of us to testify before it on how, based on the U.S. experience, they could make their environmental laws more enforceable. And they asked for an uh, industry lawyer, an academic, and an environmental lawyer. So uh, I w went along with uh, Jim Holtkamp of Holland and Hart here, who uh, is going to be on a panel uh, at the symposium. And we spent an entire afternoon being grilled by the uh, person writing the environmental legislation for the standing committee about what we thought were fairly simple things like, is it really true that under American environmental laws, you calculate penalties based upon the days of violation? It's a fundamental principle of US environmental law from the start. Um, and here, Jim will, from the industry standpoint, will say that as well. And uh, shortly thereafter, they did in fact amend their basic environmental law, uh, adopting a lot of the things that we recommended. When President Obama first met Chinese President Xi Jinping in June 2013, uh, they agreed on a nice step towards cooperation on environmental issues, and that was to use the Montreal Protocol process to control substances that deplete the ozone layer to control a very powerful greenhouse gas. It has turned out one of the great synergies of environmental regulation has been that a lot of the substances that deplete the ozone layer are also powerful greenhouse gases. And by using that process, which despite the fact that industry had said it was going to be way too costly to phase out CFCs, once the regulations were in place, substitutes developed much more cheaply and much faster than anyone imagined. Uh, the result has been that we've now achieved greater reductions under the Montreal Protocol than under the Kyoto Protocol in greenhouse gases, even though the Montreal Protocol was designed to protect the ozone layer and not to protect against climate change. Now, China in 2007 became the leading emitter of greenhouse gases in the world, passing the United States. And as of 2011, China emissions are much higher than the U.S. Between the U.S. and China, we account for about half of all global emissions. Why is it so hard to get them to agree, though? Well, on a per capita basis, U.S. emissions are still a few times greater than China's. And on a historical basis, our emissions, and those emissions are all still contributing to the problem, are much greater than China's as well. So it's quite, and at the same time, China has been improving the carbon intensity, energy efficiency of its economy, but uh, at, because its economy has been growing so fast, its emissions have been going up quite quickly as well. Last fall, the UN held a global climate summit, and at that summit, President Obama challenged the Chinese leaders to join the United States in pledging to cap and reduce their emissions of greenhouse gases. Uh, what people didn't know was that secret talks had been underway for most of the year between the U.S. and Chinese governments on an agreement where China, for the first time announced in November, agreed that it would cap its emissions of greenhouse gases by 2030, if not sooner. Um, and this agreement has really been a complete game changer. And it's in part because the Chinese so value the American experience where we now have clean air and are not struggling 
with some of the basic issues of public health, and yet we also have a healthy economy. Uh, China committed to peak its CO2 emissions by, by 2030, if not sooner, and to increase its share of energy derived from renewables to 20%. It previously had a target of 15%. This is the actual uh, text of the agreement. Among the things in the agreement are that the U.S. and China are going to work together to set up a carbon capture and storage power plant in China using advanced technology that they're going to develop together. And technology transfer, of course, is something that the Chinese are always very uh, interested in. Now, the usual argument that was used against uh, the U.S. taking additional measures to control our emissions of greenhouse gases was the Chinese aren't doing it. I think this cartoon captures well what happened after the announcement. The elephant says we shouldn't cut our carbon emissions because China won't cut theirs. Uncle Sam says they just agreed to cut theirs. The elephant says we shouldn't cut ours for some other reason. Uh, and in fact, um, one of the criticisms of this agreement, the initial reaction was, well, it doesn't require the Chinese to do anything until 2030. I heard that when I was speaking at the National Federalist Society uh, annual convention in November, and I was on a panel about EPA's clean power plan, which would become fully effective in what year? 2030. Uh, people were complaining that it makes, means we have to do things now if we're going to achieve all these things by 2030. The same is true in China. And in fact, they've redoubled their efforts. Uh, now, this also could be a game changer for the global climate negotiations. Every year, there's a meeting of the nations who are parties to the Framework Convention and the Kyoto Protocol. And the last meeting was held in Lima. Uh, it was very contentious, as always. There uh, ultimately was an agreement. And I think most observers, but not all, said that the US-China deal had improved the chances of reaching a new global agreement to replace Kyoto in Paris next year. Uh, in 2012, the world community had agreed to agree uh, that even though they couldn't agree then, they said, by 2015, when we meet in Paris, we want to have, we're going to agree on a new deal. Now, because of the U.S.-China accord, because the two largest emitters are agreeing to uh, cap their emissions, uh, it looks like the chances of a global agreement are greater. Now, of course, India is the other uh, potential wild card, but pollution there has gotten even worse than in China. It's now estimated that uh, 1.5 million citizens of India die every year as a result of exposure to pollution. Uh, and in fact, levels of uh, PM 2.5 are greater in New Delhi than in Beijing. They have been for most of the last two years. When President Obama visited India recently, he hoped that he could get the Indian government to agree on a similar agreement uh, that China had agreed to. They weren't willing to go that far, but the press all reported that they'd never seen such extraordinary awareness of the need for the Indian government to improve its controls on pollution uh, because, uh, in fact, one columnist actually had uh, calculated based on the epidemiological data from the WHO report that President Obama's expected lifetime had been cut by six hours because he had spent three days in New Delhi where the air quality uh, was so bad. Now, another example that I'm going to talk about tomorrow of this new era of global cooperation that didn't require any international treaty is the phase out of leaded gasoline. When the US did it, despite the fact that some of the gasoline companies said where there's going to be gasoline shortages, it's going to make gasoline really expensive. The results were so dramatic, dramatic reductions in average lead levels in children's blood throughout the United States that virtually every other country in the world now has phased it out but for Afghanistan, Myanmar, North Korea, Algeria, Iraq, and Yemen. Um, so this is something where by borrowing from each other, by learning from experience, other countries realized they could have the same health benefits. Did not require a global treaty, and it's had 
enormous economic benefits as well. Uh, a study published in Environmental Health has estimated that the global benefits of the phase out of lead and gasoline, uh, if you're going to do hard-nosed economic cost-benefit analysis, are about $2.3 trillion. Um, another piece of good news is that while some have said the era of global environmental treaties is over, the nations of the world recently agreed on the Minamata Convention on Control of Mercury Pollution. It's named after the town in Japan, which uh, had the great tragedy as a result of mercury poisoning in the small fishing village there back in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, and this is the only way we can really protect ourselves. Scientists have estimated that about 30% of the mercury west of the Mississippi River in the United States originates in Asia, largely from coal-fired ch power plants in China. And unless they agreed to control their mercury emissions, we'd be vulnerable to that. Most of the global emissions of mercury do originate in Asia. Uh, now, the other amazing uh, piece of good news is that the US became the first nation in the world to, we could, actually, they had a signing ceremony in October 2013 in uh, Japan. The U.S. delegation, unfortunately, was not able to sign, not because they didn't have the authority to sign, but because there was the temporary government shutdown and they couldn't have any funds to support them, so they had to fly home without signing it. The U.S. subsequently signed it. And it then became the first nation in the world to effectively ratify it. It was not submitted to the Senate for ratification. Instead, the State Department deposited our instruments of exception, ex acceptance. How could we do that? We could do it because our environmental laws are already so good on controlling mercury that everything that we're required to do by the new Minamata Convention, we already have the authority to do, and President Obama is committing to do it, so he needs no more authority from the Senate. So looking back over this history, uh, we can see that we haven't solved all our air quality problems, but if you look through the eyes of a lens of China, things certainly look pretty good, but you also have to realize that this has been a long struggle that's extended for a century now. And the history shows that small little actions, one vote of a judge on a court can make a huge difference in what type of legal regime we're going to be living, in, living under in the future. Our Clean Air Act has shown that it is a model of both comprehensiveness and adaptability, that it's been able to respond to problems that we may have thought about when it was enacted but not really focused on. Now as new knowledge becomes available, we've been able to apply it uh, in a flexible fashion. And the more you look at what was said in opposition to the bold moves we made, the more you should discount the cries of doom that you hear about. If we do this, it's going to shut down the economy. All these people will be put out of work. We now in the United States have three times more people working in the solar energy industry than we do in the coal industry. Our economy has adapted. And we are able to have both clean air and a healthy economy. And as other countries around the world see this, clean air has become a global imperative. And a new era of global environmental cooperation may occur to pursue that end for the whole planet. Thank you. Only one 
House Bill 226 will pass. And those of us who really don't care what the legislative states are going to use that bill to push the DAQ and the DEQ of Utah to be more aggressive in their regulatory values. We're also going to work on a new campaign called for Utah called Just Frigging Vote. And we're going to vote out to all the people whose clean air uh, attitude during this legislative session is bad. Do you have any other suggestions for us? Well, I mean, the, the real tragedy as you look at this history is that clean air used to be a bipartisan issue. Um, and, and, it, and it should be a bipartisan issue. And, you know, if you look at you know, how the economies responded to the regulations we've done in the past, uh, I don't think you can come up with any instance where if we weakened a reg, there were huge benefits that, that uh, we encountered. And yet that seems to be, you know, the myth that uh, uh, people try to sell. Uh, I, I still am totally mystified at how close-minded some of the people who, they really don't like environmentalists, they want to demonize them, and say they're, you know, they're out to, they're rent-seeking for their own special interests and stuff, and that, that's certainly not the environmentalists uh, that I know. But, you know, one thing you do, I'll give you an example. I gave a talk uh, to a Federalist Society crowd at the U.S. Capitol, and basically everyone in attendance were Republicans, and, uh, you know, I said, you're on the wrong side of the climate change issue. Historically, it's going to come back to bite you in the future. Afterwards, one of the top uh, aides to a senator who I have to, I won't disclose who it is, came up to me and said, look, just between you and me, I know you're right, but you have to realize the politics we're dealing with. What could we do that might, I might be able to sell? And I said, well, cut subsidies that damage the environment. That should be a good conservative issue. Uh, you want to cut the budget, you know, cut some of the subsidies. Look for ways in which you can make some kind of strategic alliances. Um, the original environmental movement had lots of libertarians, bird watchers, and uh, conservative Republicans who were upset by the fact that their children weren't going to get to enjoy an environment as good as, as they had, and the fact that you know, their private space was being invaded by these pollutants. Um, but it's a real tough issue. All the reasons you attributed to China you know, showing progress, the Olympics didn't enter into that list. Anybody ever remark about that? Well, the Olympics, there were a lot of temporary measures. They gave every workers vacations, shut down factories and the like. The, the funny thing, but I was living there for the six months before the Olympics. I was hoping to stay through August of 2008, but my landlord was raising the rent tenfold just for that month, so it didn't make economic sense to me. But when I get back to the U.S., the Wall Street Journal had run an editorial called Pollution Olympics, decrying the fact that China was so polluted and they were trying to hide it for the Olympics. And it actually said, you know, in most of the developed world, we've done a really good job of having economic growth while controlling pollution. Uh, and it's because the Communist Party's running China that they haven't uh, done anything about it. So I wrote him a letter to the editor saying, wow, this is great for the first time. You're actually, instead of denouncing uh, environmental regulations in the U.S., you know, giving us some credit uh, for it. Uh, I said, what you don't appreciate is that the U.S. legal system, the very thing that you off, often rail against when an environmentalist wins one of these big cases, is the envy of the Chinese. They would love to be able to bring citizen suits against their governments. And, uh, they now are starting to authorize citizen suits in China, not against the government, but against polluters. So it's small progress, but still progress. Yes, uh, looking into the future, what do you think our next big opportunity is? Uh, big opportunity for, well, I, I think the climate change uh, uh, agreement and EPA's clean power plans has the potential to have enormous benefits, not just in the future from uh, dealing with the global warming and climate change problems, but also really a, a transformation of uh, our energy generation system and our, our transportation system. I'm, um, I mean, I, the reason I own a Tesla, even though it's ridiculously expensive, is because my law school 
set up EV chargers in our parking garage. And for six months, no one used them. And I'm like, I'm the head of our environmental program. I should step up to the plate if I can convince my wife to make, uh, allow me to spend such a ridiculous amount of money. But green tech, it, it, it's a technology that really works. I'm totally in love with my, my car. And, you know, every, and so there is, you know, the, uh, you may remember in the presidential debate, Mitt Romney um, set, accused President uh, uh, Obama of having backed losers like Solyndra and Tesla. Uh, <laughs> Tesla is certainly not a loser. Their plan is, by building this giga battery factory, hopefully to be able to cut the price of their cars in half within a few years so that more people can use them. Um, and I, I imagine my next car is actually going to be a self-driving car because by then I'll be old enough that I'll need one. With <laughs> the globalization of capital and free trade agreements, what is the future of developing countries in terms of cheating to get economic advantage to develop? Where do you see where we can close those holes? Well, I mean, that's one thing I keep... Yeah, when, when I, whenever I was lecturing in China, people would always say, but the economy, but the economy. And I'd say, look at the U.S. We had healthy economic growth. And say, well, you're a rich country and everything. Uh, and if you don't pursue a green development path, you're going to end up having huge costs uh, in the future. Uh, so the notion that somehow uh, their economic future is dependent upon uh, doing things that would damage the environment is just simply not true. Now, I think most people now realize that. You may have heard of the Chevron Ecuador litigation, the modern Jarndyce versus Jarndyce litigation has been going on for over 20 years, where villagers in Ecuador are trying to recover from Chevron for damage uh, done there. And it's just become uh, an incredible legal saga. But it's certainly the case that no self-respecting oil company would use the kind of practices Chevron's predecessor, Texaco, used in Ecuador uh, just because the government said it was okay. We now have these global networks of activists, so if a company's doing something that it shouldn't be doing that's going to harm the environment, even in some far remote corner of the world, people will find out about it. And I think that's really, you know, sort of the hope for the future, that uh, by using techniques like social media and the greater ability to communicate with citizens, you'll be easier to organize people. Now, there have been a lot of environmental protests in China. Unfortunately, most of those have been kind of not in my backyard protests. They discover chemical plants being built and, you know, they end up raising so much hell it gets moved somewhere else to a community that's less informed. Um, but nevertheless, I think there's a great potential for that to, in developing countries, uh, help empower citizens to improve their environment. Uh, what is your crystal ball for Paris? Is, is the U.S.-China accord enough to change the fundamental set of dynamics that led to so many disappointing councils in the world? Yeah, it certainly, it, it already has changed the dynamics in a way that makes the chances of success uh, at Paris a lot greater. Um, will there actually be an agreement? Uh, I mean, what you saw at Copenhagen was there were five countries that really detest the U.S. that were just going to, you know, block anything from being approved that the U.S. was going to be a party to. To a certain extent, there's some of that dynamic, but there's a lot more momentum because of the 2012 pledge. We will all agree in Paris. So the question will be, is what's agreed to in Paris something that really proves to be enforceable that will be taken seriously. And there, if they build in things like, you know, potential trade sanctions against countries that don't fulfill their commitments, you might get some real tractions. What is your thinking about the fossil fuel investment campaign that's been going on? Um, it's nice symbolically. Um, it's, I've been approached by students at my alma mater who want to start one of those uh, as well. Um, it's not going to change the companies. Uh, it probably will uh, not be significant enough to have any real impact on their stock prices, but it certainly is nice to um, know that you know, your, the portfolio of the institutions that you care about uh, takes into account environmental things. 
you for bringing a largely optimistic message. <laughs> I, I'm a little bit worried about the time scale on doing things on climate change. And I wonder if anything in the past history related to today gives us optimism about that too. Because I think the, the combination, even though you know, China agreeing by 2030 to cap, etc., the growth of the population plus combined with the energy appetite per capita means that we're still increasing CO2 concentrations by three parts per million with probably that going on for maybe 50 years or more. And with CO2, unlike mercury, the lifetime in the atmosphere is two or three hundred years, not a few days. So what gives you optimism that we're going to do this one? But you're exactly right. Uh, and I think everyone realizes that nothing that happens at Paris is probably, that's politically feasible, is probably going to fulfill the goal that was set of keeping uh, the rise to two degrees, the rise in temperatures to two degrees Celsius on average. I think that's why so much more attention is now being focused on adaptation and what can we do to help those who are going to be most harmed by the changes that inevitably are going to take place? But at the same time, we shouldn't you know, view this as anything goes, so we don't have to worry about you know, mitigation, just focus on adaptation. Paris, at least, will be a step in the, the right direction on mitigation. I think there is some danger, though, that, that folks may say, well, um, you know, we should geoengineer and, and launch some cockeyed scheme to change the atmosphere, thinking that that's the only thing that can get dramatic changes. Um, it's good to be exploring uh, what options are out there, but there's a real problem in that we don't have an international legal framework yet set up to deal with geoengineering. And what if one country says, okay, I'm gonna do it and does something that harms uh, another country, that would be, you know, an issue that would be nice if it could be folded into whatever agreements are reached in Paris. Let me uh, uh, ask you to join me in uh, thanking uh, once again Bob for the <laughs>